So we are in the fourth week of this sermon series called Pointers. And the idea is we are asking the question, how do our lives point to Jesus Christ as our Savior and as our Lord? And we started by looking at how we raise and influence our children and youth, not just in our households, but as part of the household of God. How do we raise our children and our youth in such a way that points to Jesus Christ as our Savior and as our Lord? And then we looked at how we use our time, how we invest and manage our time, and how does that point to Jesus Christ as our Savior and as our Lord? And then last week, Gary talked about how we choose our friends. How does the choice of our friends point to Jesus Christ as our Savior and as our Lord? And I love that Gary spoke some last week about that includes how we choose our marriage partners. How does that point to Jesus Christ as our Savior and as our Lord? And today, we're going to talk about how we choose our words, meaning spoken words and also meaning written words, meaning, you know, words that we text and post or email, words that we speak and words that we type. How do those point to Jesus Christ as our Savior and as our Lord? And I pray that God would prepare our hearts and our minds to hear what he has for us today, to hear it and receive it and apply it to our lives consistently and faithfully in public and in private settings in response to his call on all of our lives to be and make disciples of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Holy God, patient God, merciful and mighty God. Thank you for helping us. Thank you for teaching us. Open our hearts to receive what you want us to hear and know today. Strengthen our resolve to be not just hearers of the word, but doers also. Holy Spirit, come. Speak to us as only you can. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I just want to say, if you've got a phone out, would you please put your phones away? I heard a story about a husband who said to his wife um, that he had read an article that women use 30,000 words a day to men's men's 15,000 words a day. And his wife replied, well, that's because we have to repeat everything to men. And his husband, or her husband said, what? What? (laughs) Just a little humor to get us started for today. Um, Because this is a heavy, it's a heavy message. Um, Because we all know that words can hurt, and words can help, and words can heal. We all have spoken things and written things that we know we shouldn't have. We have been witnesses to other people saying things and typing things that we know should not have been said or typed. We have been recipients, I'm sure, of things that people have said or typed to us that should not have been said. Words can hurt. But words can also help and heal. And hopefully we have all been, uh, we've all said things at the right time to the right person in the right, you know, in the right place. And that's always like such a great thing when that happens. Thanks be to God every time that happens. Hopefully we have also been witnesses when someone has said something to somebody else and we were there and that encouraged them and it encouraged us to see them being encouraged. And hopefully we have been recipients of words that have encouraged us. Words can help and words can heal. Unfortunately, it seems like in the world that we live in that there seem to be more words that hurt um, being used than words that help and heal. But this should not be the case for followers of Jesus Christ. This should not be the case for followers of Jesus Christ. This should not be the case for followers of Jesus Christ. The question for today is how do the words that we choose to say and the words that we choose to write How do they point to our faith and our devotion and our commitment to Jesus Christ as our Savior and as our Lord? Our scripture for today is from James chapter 3. It's a very powerful scripture, and 
In some ways, I thought I could read this and probably just say amen, but I'm a preacher, so I got to preach it. So I'm going to read this. Um, may the Lord open our ears and hearts to hear. Not many of you should become teachers, my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We all stumble in many ways. Anyone who is never at fault in what they say is perfect, able to keep their whole body in check. When we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we can turn the whole animal. Or take ships as an example. Although they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are steered by a very small rudder wherever the pilot wants to go. Likewise, the tongue is a small part of the body, but it makes great boasts. Consider what a great forest is set on fire by a small spark. The tongue also is a fire, a world of evil among the parts of the body. It corrupts the whole body, sets the whole course of one's life on fire, and is itself set on fire by hell. All kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. With the tongue, we praise our Lord and Father, and with it we curse human beings who have been made in God's likeness. Out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers and sisters, can a fig tree bear olives or a grapevine bear figs? Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So James is pointing out to us that if if you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, then the words you speak should reflect his character. The words you speak, speak and write, should reflect his character. Because if we're trying to be like someone, then we want to do what they do and we want to say what they say. So if I'm a follower, follower of Jesus Christ, then I'm not talking with clean, uplifting words on a Sunday, and then for the rest of the week, I'm talking with filthy, degrading words. On Sunday, I'm not talking with clean, uplifting words, and then talking with filthy, degrading words for the rest of the week. James said, out of the same mouth come praise and cursing, my brothers and sisters, this should not be. This should not be. It should not be. In Colossians 4, Paul writes this, and this is from the paraphrase, the message. Pray diligently. Stay alert with your eyes wide open in gratitude. Don't forget to pray for us that God will open doors for telling the mystery of Christ even while I'm locked up in jail. Pray that every time I open my mouth, I'll be able to make Christ plain as day to them. Use your heads as you live and work among outsiders. Don't miss a trick. Make the most of every opportunity. Be gracious in your speech. The goal is to bring out the best in others in a conversation, not put them down and not cut them out. Pray that every time I open my mouth, I'll be able to make Christ plain as day to them. What if we had that as our filter? With what we say and what we type. Pray that everything I say and everything I type would make Christ plain as day to those who are reading or hearing what we're saying. Back in August, when I took a staycation, I spent some time at my house. I was just, I did some reorganizing, some cleaning out, and in doing that, I found a letter that my sister Drew had written to me 19 years ago, um, the week before I was ordained. I can honestly say I do not remember reading the letter. I'm sure I did, but in the hustle and bustle of everything that was going on, I, pro- I just didn't remember. And so God put this letter in my hand that week. And in this letter, she said lovely things, but this one just really spoke to me. She said, you add a calmness and a faithfulness to all of our lives that is easy to follow. Thank you. Now, I really believe that God put that letter in my hands now before we went up there to that wedding and all, that, all the crazy stuff happened there. It just reminded me, this is, this is my part in my crazy family. This is my part 
is to help keep things calm and to provide a sense of faithfulness in the midst of it and having all the explosions in Lawrence and having to move the wedding 24 hours beforehand. I mean, and, and so I'm just saying to myself, you know, let's just help everybody stay as calm as possible. Let's look for the good things that are happening. Let's remember that it's really about the marriage. It's not so much about the wedding service itself. And so these words that were written 19 years ago were so powerful to me, but they pointed me to the ancient words of my Lord that says, to be a dispenser of peace. To be a dispenser of peace. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote in his book, Life Together, and this is a book that Lori and I um, study in our morning devotions when we're here. Um, he wrote this, often we combat our evil thoughts most effectively if we absolutely refuse to allow them to be expressed in words. We combat our evil thoughts if we absolutely refuse to allow them to be expressed in words, spoken or written. It is certain that the spirit of self-justification that can overcome, be overcome only by the spirit of grace, nevertheless, isolated thoughts of judgment can be curbed and smothered by never allowing them the right to be uttered, except as a confession of faith. Except as a, a confession of sin, sorry. Except as a confession of sin. Forgive me, Lord, for having those thoughts. Ephesians 4.29 says, Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. George Whitfield was a famous preacher and evangelist back in the 1700s. He was part of the revival in England and then came over here in the 1740s, was part of the Great Awakening in our country. In one year, I read that he traveled 5,000 miles, we're thinking horses here, through America, preaching more than 350 times as he went north and south in our country. And it says that there's an estimated 25,000 people heard him preach at Boston Commons. 25,000, no amplification. Another 12,000 heard him preach in Philadelphia and 8,000 in New York City. So in 15 months, as much as a quarter of our country had heard his message. And there's no radio, there's no TV. You know, a quarter of our country had heard him preach. Yet for all the good he did, of course, he had critics. And he often received letters of criticism and mockery and hateful correction. And sometimes he became discouraged by the letters that he got. But he soon learned that the best response to a critic was openness and honesty. So after receiving a letter of personal attack, he wrote one simple reply to its sender. I thank you heartily for the letter. As for what you and my other enemies are saying against me, I know worse things about myself than you will ever say about me. With love in Christ, George Whitfield. Isn't that just so true? I mean, I know a whole lot more junk about myself than anybody could ever say against me. What a wonderful way to respond with love in Christ, George Whitfield. Speaking and writing words that honor God all the time is hard at first. It's hard at first, but it gets easier. It does. It becomes more natural as we mature in our faith in Christ. But sometimes it's still hard because people provoke us, people poke us, people presume things about us, and we have to set them straight, right? No, no, <laughs> because your example and my example of holding our tongue until we are sure what the godly response should be, not just saying the first thing that pops into our mouth, that example makes a much bigger impression and more lasting impression than any screaming match or well-placed dig ever, ever could. I saw this image on Facebook last week and it literally gave me a punch in my stomach. We have to think before we speak, folks. Whether the person that we're speaking to is a child or a youth or an adult, as followers of Jesus Christ, we need to want that our words point to him as our Savior and our Lord. Remember what Jesus said, Take my yoke upon you and um, be gentle and humble in heart. 
that we want our words to, to be that gentle and humble in heart, pointing to Jesus Christ as our Savior and as our Lord, always having a sense of gratitude in our heart for the gift of salvation that we have, and also, also submitting to him, to his authority in our lives as our Lord. Bullying others at home And I know that there are husbands and wives that bully each other. I know that there are siblings who bully each other. There's parents who bully their kids, and there's kids who bully their parents. There's adult children who bully their senior-aged parents. Bullying others at home, at school, on the playground, in a text message, on Instagram, Snapchat, Facebook, emails, in a note stuck on a locker, or a whisper behind the hand, or in a card, maybe an anonymous card sent through the mail, using words to intentionally hurt and harm people is not God's design for us as followers of Jesus Christ. This is not God's design for us as followers of Jesus Christ. And so what do we do? What do we do? I mean, James 3, 7 said this, all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and sea creatures are being tamed and have been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. It doesn't sound real hopeful, does it? I mean, what do we do? It seems very clear that, that we, we can't do anything. We can't tame the tongue. No human being can tame the tongue, the scripture says. And so we have to fall on our face before the Lord. We have to yield our tongues to the Lord. We have to yield our lives and our tongues to the Lord because he can tame it. The Holy Spirit who lives inside of all those who have professed Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord has enough power inside of us. It's the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. And so we ask God for help. We ask God for help and then we do what he says because he will show us what to do. He will show us what to say and what not to say. We ask God for help. We can't ask God for help, though, folks, and then just keep on doing what we've been doing, speaking the words that we've been saying and texting words that are rude and degrading to others, and then say, well, I asked God for help, and he didn't really help me. God will help us change anything in our lives if we really, really, really want to change. God will help you. God will help me change anything. Anything, anything, anything in our lives if we really, really want to change. Amen? Amen. He will. I say it often, breathe and pray. Breathe and pray. Stop, breathe, pray, repeat. Stop, breathe, pray, repeat. Breathe and pray before you say something that reveals the sin nature that's got a hold of you as opposed to revealing the character of Christ. We need to be quick to saying words like, I'm sorry, and forgive me, and I was wrong, and thank you. You know, your plan is, your plan is much better than mine. Let not cursing and blessing be coming out of the same mouth. It should not be but we need to speak words of grace and words of encouragement and words of truth and words of love to one another, not words that manipulate or deceive or words that tear others down. And these sarcastic jokes that we put out there sometimes that really are just hidden ways to to demean others, uh, what's the point, really? To, To become the center of attention? Breathe in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Let's... Get into that practice of just breathing in, stopping, and breathing in the presence of the Holy Spirit. Who will help us know when to speak and when to be silent? I mean, just think if the politicians would start to do that. That'd be pretty awesome, wouldn't it? (laughs) I want to close this morning by reading one of Aesop's fables, and this fable is called The Tongues. Xanthus invited a large company to dinner, and Aesop was ordered to furnish the feast with the choicest dainties that money could procure. The first course consisted of tongues, 
cooked in different ways and served with appropriate sauces. This gave rise to a deal of mirth and witty remarks among the assembled guests. The second course, however, like the first, was also nothing but tongues, and so the third and the fourth. The matter seemed to all have gone beyond a jest, and Xanthus angrily demanded of Aesop, did I not tell you, sir, to provide the choicest dainties that money could procure? And what excels the tongue, replied Aesop? It is the great channel of learning and philosophy. By this noble organ, addresses and eulogies are remade, and commerce and contracts and marriages completely established. Nothing is equal to the tongue. Well, the company applauded Aesop's wit, and good humor was restored. Well, said Xanthus to the guest, pray do me the favor of dining with me again tomorrow. And if this is your best, continued he, turning to Aesop, pray tomorrow let us have some of the worst meat that you can find. Well, the next day, when dinner time came, the guests were assembled. Great was their astonishment and great the anger of Xanthus at finding that, again, nothing but tongues was put upon the table. How, sir, said Xanthus, should tongues be the best meat of the day one day and the worst another? What, replied Aesop, can be worse than the tongue? What wickedness is there under the sun that it has not had a part in? Treasons, violence, injustice, and fraud are debated, resolved upon, and communicated by the tongue. It is the ruin of empires and cities and of private friendships. The company were more than ever struck by Aesop's ingenuity and successfully interceded for him with his master. As those who are choosing to be disciples of Jesus Christ, the words that we say with our mouths and the words we say with our fingers should all be words that come from a heart that exalts Jesus Christ as our Savior and as our Lord. In public, and in private, on Sundays, and on every other day of the week, at home, at work, on the soccer field, on the volleyball court, the football field, on the bus, in the locker rooms. The words that we say with our mouths and with our fingers should not dishonor others, should not dishonor ourselves, and most importantly, should not dishonor our God. Words can hurt, but words can also help, and words can heal. So by the power at work within us, the power of the Holy Spirit, let us be those who choose helping and healing words of grace that make Christ plain as day for all who have eyes to see. Jesus Christ as our Savior and as our Lord. Amen.